We are so delighted to have Father Brian Pierce, who is going to be here uh, for two months at St. Anne's, and he actually wants to work with the farm workers. I have told him that there's a letter came out to all the priests in the diocese saying, you can go to the ocean uh, where there are, are a lot of well-off people that come for the summer, and there's a parish there that needs help. They, they will give the priest a condo and promise that he'll have great meals, plus he'll get a stipend. And uh, he, he had that chance, but instead, Father Brian, for some reason, which we are, you're going to find out, <laughs> decided to come here to work with farm workers. And uh, he's visited already uh, at least one camp, and he can tell you that it's not exactly like living in a condo, uh, but we're delighted to have Father Brian, uh, and he's going to tell you a little bit about himself and why, in God's name, he is here. <laughs> God's name. No, you, you've worked in Central America, South America, and you uh, are willing, you are willing to work and want to work with the, the poor people in our area, and they are really poor. We have young men, older men, who come here from March until November working on the farms in really hot weather. Uh, they live in barracks. They don't even have uh, private bathrooms or anything. They have outhouses and out, uh, sh outside showers or outdoor showers. So. Uh, tell me, you're, you're here to work with these men. Tell us why. Well, I, um, I was a foreign exchange student in high school to Peru. And um, I didn't sign up to it. Um, my Spanish teacher put my name into a, a, a list of possible people who could be given a, a scholarship as foreign exchange students. And I was one of the ones chosen. And, I never asked to do it, and uh, I was 17 years old, and uh, off I went to Peru as a foreign exchange student, and um, it was uh, a, a huge, shocking experience for me. I had never been outside of the United States. I wasn't quite sure how I had been chosen. Um, and I happened to land in Peru, in Cusco, Peru, at the time of a very violent war going on. Um, the people that were, had organized the program weren't aware that the, that the violence was as bad as it was, um, so they sent us there anyways, but it was pretty, um, pretty rough. I saw a number of people killed in the first month or two that I was there. Um, the house I lived in was across the street from the university in Cusco, Peru. Beautiful, uh, ancient Incan city. And um, I was there for several months and um, saw the beauty, saw, got to hike to Machu Picchu. Beautiful, it's a beautiful country, Peru. But when I returned to the United States, what was really... Um, heavy on my heart was the violence and the, the dead, death experience that I saw of people being killed. And I came back to the, U the U.S. I finished my high school, but I had this question always in my mind, why, why were those people being killed? Why were the, they were, mostly university students were being killed. And I saw them killed in front of my eyes. And that question just went on and on and on. And um, I switched my major in, co in college to political science in Spanish because I wanted to, when I finally went to college, I wanted to understand what I had seen as a high school foreign exchange student. I had seen all this, nobody ever explained it to us. Um, I remember the day we were leaving from Lima in, to go into Cusco. They gathered those of us that were going to Cusco. There was about 40 exchange students, but we were going to all these different cities. 
but Cusco was the one where the violence was. And they called us together, the seven or eight of us that were going to Cusco. And they said to us, um, we need to tell you that you're going into a, a very difficult situation in Cusco. There's a, there's a lot of violence going on. And you will not be able to leave your house from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Of course, when you're, a, when you're a high school student, to think you can't go outside after 6 p.m. was really a big deal for us, you know. And we said, well, we, we said, why? And why can't we go outside? And the woman said to us, I'll never forget it. She says, if you go outside of the house between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., the army will shoot you dead. So here's a 17-year-old kid from Texas, now in a city where I'll be, I'll be shot dead if I go outside after six in the evening, you know. It was quite a, um, an, it just shook me up. I had never seen a violent act in my life. And I saw people killed during those months. And so I came back to the United States. I finished high school. I went into college. I wanted to study forestry as a college student. I went to a, a school that had a great forestry school in East Texas. But I couldn't get Peru out of my mind, and so I changed my, uh, my, my major to Spanish and, and uh, political science because I wanted to understand violence and war and hunger and poverty and all these things I had seen in Peru. I wanted to understand what causes this? Why do these countries, are they so broken and so poor and there's so much violence? And um, I spent my time in Peru. I learned a lot. Went to college, studied political science. I learned more about, about the world and about social issues and politics and war and peace and and at the end of my college years I um, I thought I would go and try to do something like go to the Peace Corps or something like that but instead I, I met cloistered Dominican nuns in East Texas where I 15 minutes from our university a community of, of Dominican cloistered nuns and a group of us from the Newman Center started going to visit these nuns and um, somehow the experience in Peru, the violence, seeing death, and then meeting this group of women that spent their whole lives praying. You know, it's a cloistered life. That's their whole life is prayer. And those two things in my last year of college came together. Um, I had been studying political science for four years. I wanted to do something like Peace Corps kind of work. And yet I, I was so moved by the example of these women spending their entire lives in a cloistered monastery that somehow by the time I, I, I finished high school and college, those two things had come together and I knew that somehow I wanted my life or I felt God was calling me to bring my love for the poor and my Catholic faith into one. And I wasn't quite sure how to do that, but I, could, I knew that was where I, I, I loved both of these. I, I had learned a lot from these cloistered Dominican nuns and I had learned a lot about the world by living in Peru, a very poor country. And somehow I said, I want to I wanna live a life where those two things can be brought together. And in some ways, that's what's happened in my life. I joined the Dominicans right after college, um, did my studies. Uh, I did one of my years of theology in Peru because I wanted to get learn theology from the third world, not just looking at it from a distance. And I ended up spending uh, uh, 11 or 12 years working with the poor in South, Central and South America, Honduras, Guatemala, and Peru. And um, 
those 11 years were very powerful years for me too. Um, not only help the poor, but live with the poor and learn from the poor. And uh, we were working with lay men and women who are called delegates of the word. And it was in the, in the, in the 1970s, the, the church in, in uh, Honduras began preparing lay people to be preachers to go up into the mountain villages and preach the gospel. It was a very um, forward-looking bishop that had this intuition. The only way we're going to bring the gospel to all the country is we've got to send people into the villages up in the mountains. They're not, they're not being catechized and you know, so um, this bishop said, let's train lay people to take the Bible and go to all of the villages all over the country. And they, that, that went on for about 30 or 40 years. It's still going on, actually. And so these, these lay people, and, and the reason I'm talking about this is because the, the bishop asked us, the Dominicans, if we would teach these lay people to share the gospel with others. That's our, our charism. The Dominicans are we're a preaching order. So he, the, the bishop said, could you put together a little course so that we can train lay people? Because there, it's, a, it's a country with a very small number of priests. They, there's no way they could go to the hundreds of villages and, and evangelize. So they had, this bishop had this wonderful insight. He says, let's prepare lay people teach them how to read the Bible, how to share the Bible with others, and, and let's send them out to all the villages all over the country. And that happened, that started in the 1970s. It was actually a, a Canadian bishop who had the intuition to first mention this idea. This idea. And today, to this day in Honduras, uh, 30, 40 years later, there are still delegates of the word going every Sunday into villages with their Bibles, sharing the gospel and the readings for each Sunday and preaching about them. Uh, so that's the work we were asked to do. We were, the bishop asked us if we would train delegates of the word of God and prepare them to go into the, to, to evangelize in the villages and towns all over the country. And we would meet with them monthly and do workshops with them and they would go out again. And, um, you know, they were, these were family, you know, men and women that were living with their families. But on Saturdays and Sundays, they were out visiting the poor and announcing the good news. So that was our work, um, preparing them training them, teaching them how to read the scriptures and share it. And uh, was, for a group of, of Dominicans, it was wonderful because we were able to use our charism of preaching um, and teach them not, not exactly to become preachers, but to become evangelizers, that they could take the, the scriptures and, and share them with others. Um, I, I'd like to just share one little story about one a uh, delegate of the word, a, a man by the name of Felipe Huete. He was, in, in several of our courses that we gave, he was a wonderful, um, very committed husband and father. Um, and he was one of these that was every Saturday and Sunday, he was up in the mountains evangelizing. Uh, another piece of the life in Central America in those years and continues almost even more in these years is the violence. And the violence is usually has something to do with land in, in these parts of, the, of, the, of Latin America. It's fighting for land and the big landowners who grab land and run the peasants off and things like that. Um, so Felipe Huete was a delegate of the word and he also had a little farm. He's a very poor man. The, the, poor, the poor families have little tiny farms that they farm. And, and what happens in these countries is little by little, the large landowners 
come and they take the land away from the small peasant landowners that might have one or two acres of land, that's all they have. And the large landowners have 200, 300, 400, 500 acres of land. So Felipe Huete was a, a delegate of the word. He had been in our courses that we had given. And he was also a farmer. And uh, one day the army came and surrounded his land and told Felipe Huete that he and his family were to leave the land, that land was going to now be theirs. And Felipe said, but this is my land, but this is, we've farmed this land for years. And it was, it was a, a high military guy that wanted this land, and he said, no, this land is now my land. And so the peasants came and uh, occupied the land, they sat on it, and said, this is our land. And Felipe Huete was sort of the leader of this. And at one point, the army came and said, you have so much time before we're going to start shooting to get off this land. And Felipe Huete stood up and he said to the, to the colonel, whoever was giving this order, he said, this land belongs to the poor. And then the colonel said, shoot. And they shot him dead right, in, right then and there. Um, so that, that happened and now I, I just want to go back to a, 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 a piece of that story a few months after that death of this great delegate of the word great martyr I'm sure someday he will be canonized just for saying this is our land please respect it and they shot him about two years later, we were in another part of the country giving a preaching course, which is what we did. Lay people for a three or four day workshop on preaching. And at always at the beginning of our preaching class, courses, we would ask each one of the people coming to the course to say something about themselves and why they wanted to be preachers. Why did they want to be delegates of the Word of God? And so one, two, three, four, several people stood up and said, well, you know, I've, I've um, seen our delegates of the word and I'd like to do what they do or my, you know, etc." And I, in this series of people sharing why they were coming to this course, this young man stood up and he opened his Bible in his hand. And he said, uh, he began, he introduced himself and he said, uh, this Bible was the Bible of my father. Now, none of us knew who this young man was at that moment. He said, this Bible was my father's Bible. And he said, uh, I, can't, I can't remember his name, but it was something like Francisco Huete, this is the last name. And he says, my father was Felipe Huete the delegate of the word who stood up in the middle of the field that day with his Bible saying, this is our land and we are here to work it. And so this, yeah, this young son of, of Felipe Huete was at the course that day. We didn't expect, we didn't know who he was and we didn't expect Felipe Huete's son to be there. And he closed his Bible that day and he said the following to us. He said, uh, he said, my father was killed, as most of you know, doing his work as a delegate of the word. And, he, and so his son said to us, the Sunday after my father's death, he said, we all went to church and he said, nobody said a word. We, we didn't know what to say. Felipe was the one who always broke open the word for us, and he was now dead. And his son is telling this story. He says, my whole family was there. All of our community was there. We didn't know what to do. And Felipe said, I had my father's Bible in my hand. And he said, we sat there for 45 minutes or an hour, and 
utter silence because we didn't know what to do. The delegate of the word of our community was dead. And his son, Rodrigo might have been his name, his son said, I was holding my father's Bible and my hands started burning. And he said, I just, I kept holding this Bible and it was just burning in my hands. And he said, all of a sudden, I found myself standing up in front of all these delegates of the word that were there for this course. And the people of the village that were there that day, he said, I stood up and I opened the Bible and I read a scripture text and I began to preach. He says, I don't know how I did it. But he said, my father's spirit just came into me and I did what my father did. I did what my father would have done that day if he were there. I would have, he would have stood up and read the gospel and shared the word of God with the people. So those were the kind of experiences we had with these people. It was um, an incredible experience of working with very poor people, many of whom since those days have given their lives. Many have been killed for preaching the gospel in the midst of violence. And the, the 11 years that I was in Central America, I learned time after time after time, I learned the way the poor give everything and risk and with all their simplicity, they, they give everything. And um, so that's, that's the gift that I received in those 11 years in, in Central America. And, and, and those went with me for many, have gone with me for many years since then. Um, preaching the gospel is no small task. It's life and death in some places. Um, and I'm grateful that I'm grateful that God sent me to Honduras to learn and to um, share. I then spent some time in Guatemala, then I spent five years in Peru, um, and here I am, <laughs> trying to keep preaching the word today. So uh, God is good and I'm grateful for, for these years of being able to do it what some of these martyrs did, which was take the scriptures, open it up in dangerous places, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, I'm, I have much to be grateful for. Yeah, this is the type of thing that doesn't uh, make the news, but uh, it's, it's more, the, like Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a seed, and, uh, you know, just what you describe is so beautiful, but it's, in the midst of the violence, they, you know, he stands up for justice, but just as Jesus spoke up, you know, for justice, but not in a violent way. <clears throat> and even what you said, I can't, a week after, you know, this horrible thing happened, the people didn't come together and say, how are we going to get revenge? How are we going to mm -hmm. get even? It's what is the, what is God's word? And, and uh, that kind of ministry like that you've been doing there is bringing so much peace uh, you know a realization of, of, of the injustice and the justice uh, and yet um, you know the peace and the, the hope that you bring you know through God's work I, I, I had a similar experience in Jamaica West Indies we had a man who was shot and he he wasn't Catholic he was uh, actually oddly <laughs> a Jamaican who was a Greek Orthodox, but he said, I, he, he came and spoke in our church, and he said, we need your church. <coughs> he said, the gunmen in our area, they're not going to church, <laughs> obviously. So uh, we need you people to be instruments of, you know, of peace for our young people, instruments of hope and, uh, and reconciliation. So the, he said, I'm not, I'm not leaving my neighborhood. Uh, I'm gonna stay here. <coughs> we also had a bishop from, the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and he, he works with the pygmies, 
and he was saying how they're, com they're going in, I just saw something recently, uh, they want to save the gorillas <laughs> in the jungle, but to save the gorillas and the plant life and some of the animals, they want the pygmies to get out. So the pygmies are being thrown out of, of where they, you know, have, they've, well, they've lived. lived for centuries. Yeah. yeah. But I, even I'm thinking, even in this country, there's a different, there's a different, there's different types of violence uh, and injustice. You know, we're so money hungry and taught to be money. You know, that your whole goal in life is to make money and more money and more money. That's that's really what the American dream is. And yet, there's so, there can be so much suffering and, and uh, manipulation of other people uh, by that. So, the preaching of the gospel, uh, it you know, it is like that seed. You don't. It's not like a firecracker or a bright light, but uh, just bringing the gospel message and and trying to bring justice, but also. Um, you know, the more important thing is that, you know, mercy, getting along, sharing, forgiveness. You know, Mother, Mother Teresa used to use a phrase frequent, that she would frequently say, the, the poor are beautiful people, or the great people, she would say. The poor are very great people. Um, I've learned that in, in so many ways. And another story that just popped into my mind is when I was working in Guatemala, uh, the, the catechist and I went up into the mountains for several days to visit a number of villages and on the way up the mountain into the mountains of Guatemala uh, we met a family whose daughter had just died so we went into that village and did the rites for the burial and everything it was unexpected we just happened to be walking near that village when when someone said oh the the priests are here so we went and over and celebrated this funeral. And we went up and did our work for five or six days up in the mountains. And on the way back down the mountain, so this is a week later, more or less, we're coming down the mountain. It's very, these are very steep, difficult mountains to kind of come down little by little. And I was with um, one of the catechists, and an indigenous catechist, and as we're coming down, I noticed that there was two people standing on the trail down below. You know, we're coming down a mountain like this and there's two people standing. In. And as we're getting closer, the catechist says to me, he says, oh, he says, Father, he says, that's the family that we, that we buried the daughter with on our way going up. And as we got closer, I noticed that it was the mother and father of this young girl that had died. Um, so the, we're coming down the mountain and the mother and father of this young girl who had died the week before, um, they're waiting for us and, and, and they've been waiting for us for hours. And when we got to where they were, we greeted them and the Guatemalan greeting is very formal. It's masalacho, kawa padre, and they go back and forth and and this woman did not say a single word. Her daughter had just died the week before. She just simply walked up to me like this. She took one step and she placed bananas in my hands and said, thank you. That's all she did. They had waited eight or 10 hours to say thank you. And I, I, I'll never forget it because I, I walked home the rest of, we had about four more hours to go down the mountain ourselves. And I walked down that mountain, I'll never forget, I kept thinking to myself, I feel like I'm carrying the Blessed Sacrament in my hands. Th that couple had waited 10 hours to simply give me some bananas and say thank you. Thank you for burying our daughter with dignity. And I will never forget that, that unbelievable experience of, of, I had never experienced gratitude as I did that day from that person, that family. 
Yeah. So we can see why you want to work with the poor. And we have the poor farm workers, so I'm sure they'll be very uh, appreciative of your ministry. So. That's why I, I love that phrase of Mother Teresa, the poor are great people. She would always say that, the poor are great people. And I've seen that all my life. So we're happy to have Father here for a couple of months, and if you want to find out more about his ministry with the farm workers, or if you want to volunteer, or if you want to make a donation, whatever, or uh, come with us some evening to visit one of the camps. <laughs> Prepare to spend a lot of time at the camps. Tell us just briefly about how long you, you, you went there. Talk about waiting for hours. Tell us about what happened last night at the camp. Well, we sure... <laughs> I'm new at this. this is only, I've only been out twice now to these camps. Uh, we got there at about 6.30 or something, 7. And we had all this stuff, you know, we were bringing some things to share with them, you know, toothpaste and toothbrushes and soap and t-shirts and things like that. And for some reason, um, I guess the owner of the of the camp last night decided he was going to get some extra work out of them that yesterday and instead of us meeting these people at 6 30 or 7 which is the usual time that they come back and we can share some you know gifts for them and water and snacks and things like that so we're there at six o'clock waiting for these people who are supposed to be there around 7 or 7 30 and they arrived at 11.30 last night. So we waited there for, what, five hours or something, waiting for the, these buses to show up with all the workers there. And um, so it was... Uh, so you were inspired by the lady with the bananas to, to wait a little <laughs> bit for these people so you could give them your gift. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, here are these men coming, you know, leaving their families way far away, making the trip up to the United States, working all day in these fields, getting home at 11 o'clock at night, last night they did. You know, we had, we had some food for them, but most of them just took a little bite of food and went and got in their bed. You know, we could see them all, all these cots, they were just exhausted. Um, and and they do that, they you know, they leave their homes in Mexico for five to eight months of the year just to make some money so they can take back to their kids, to their families, and you know, mend the house and and whatever you know, get their kids to school and. I mean, the sacrifice, last night I was thinking the sacrifice. These guys probably went to the field yesterday at 6 in the morning and they got home last night at 11 p.m. And then we have people saying, you know, these foreigners shouldn't be coming into our land. <laughs> They're picking our crops for us. So, um, yeah, we have a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn, and I'm learning some of it little by little. Thank you, Father.